Hello, everyone, and welcome to another bonus episode of the Stephen King Podcast. This is bonus episode number 25, and I have with me today writer, podcaster, and general media artist, Ed Willett. Hello, Ed. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. I was wondering what you are going to call me there for a minute. General... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. You have your fingers in a lot of pies, so I didn't want to, to limit your scope. <laughs> so you're also a fellow podcaster, which I, I find interesting. We'll get into that a little bit. But for people that don't know, the uh, bonus episodes of this podcast are an opportunity for other writers to come on and let my listeners uh, find out about them. And and hopefully they'll be intrigued enough to follow up and uh, check out some of their works. Uh, so, Ed, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are? Okay, well, I am, this This is like the potted bio that just comes out when people ask me that question. I am the award-winning mm -hmm. author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for readers of all ages. I uh, was born in the States. Uh, we moved up here from Texas, to, and here is Regina, Saskatchewan. When I was eight years old, ah. I grew up in a little town called Weyburn, where my dad taught school at a private school called Western Christian College. And I started writing when I was quite young. I was a huge reader. And you can tell my, my course was set because the first complete short story I wrote at age 11 was uh, called Castor Glass Hypership Test Pilot. <laughs> so wow. I was in there and I was, <laughs> I was heading for science fiction right away. Right. And I kept writing all through high school. I wrote novels in high school and everything. I, went, I studied journalism, became a newspaper reporter an editor for a few years and was a communications officer for the Saskatchewan Science Center. But I've been writing full time now since what year is this? 2020. How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, really. Eh? <laughs> it's uh, 1993 was when I became a full time freelancer. So that's how long I've been doing it full time. Oh, OK. So this is your, writing is your full time gig. Yes, I married an engineer, which was a good career move. But yes, writing is my full time uh, job. <laughs> OK, very good. Very good. And so you, you mentioned the, that you were an avid reader. Who were your favorite authors growing up and today? Well, growing up, certainly it was uh, that was in the era of Heinlein and Asimov and, and Clark. So the, right. the big three people like uh, mm -hmm. Bob Silverberg, actually, I think one of the first science fiction novels I remember reading, and I still have it, it belonged to my brother, it was Revolt on Alpha C, which Robert Silverberg wrote when he was 19. It was like his first novel. Wow. So the first one he wrote is the first one I remember reading. And I still have mm -hmm. it, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I grew up with all those kind of and Andre Norton and, of course, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and, and all of those right. people. It's hard to say who my mm -hmm. favorite authors are these days because most of the books I read are trying to, and I read little bits of them because I don't have time to read them all, is trying to read something of the authors I'm interviewing on the podcast. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, but among the ones that I never miss, like I'm following the Dresden Files, I really like. Jim right. Butcher. Yeah, um, I like David Weber's yeah. uh, books. I read, I tried to keep up with most of his. Mm -hmm. Scott Lynch is great. Oh, there's, there's a lot of them, but it's hard to pick them out because as, as I said, my reading is quite fragmented working on other mm, things. I see. Okay. So as a, f a freelance writer, th then are you doing a lot of uh, articles, nonfiction articles, or is it a mix of various things? I will do anything for a buck, basically. <laughs> so I mentioned, you know, 60 books. Well, about 20 or a couple more than that are novels. Everything else is nonfiction. Okay. So I've done, I wrote a science column, newspaper science column for years. I've written everything from a children's biography of the Ayatollah Khomeini to wow. 60 Mystified from McGraw-Hill to the history of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan. I write, I've written magazine articles, newspaper articles. Uh, I've written the annual report of the chief electoral officer of Saskatchewan. I did that one year. <laughs> so mm. uh, any, wow. anything with words. And I also do a, a lot of freelance editing and that sort of thing. I've been a writer in residence and okay. library. So, you know, like most people who try to do this full time, you piece together what you can. Right, for sure. And so with your fiction writing, is it strictly novels or do you do short stories as well? I've done some short stories. I've never been a huge short story writer. It, I put out a, a okay. collection of my short fiction uh, when I started my own little publishing company, Shadowpaw Press. My first book was Paths to the Stars, which was 22 of my short stories, mostly previously okay. published, not entirely. But that was going from my first published 
science fiction story up to the present over about 25 years, more than 25 years. Right. And it took me that, that long to scrape together enough to put a collection together. So not a huge short fiction okay. writer. I do have one coming up, but I haven't written it yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So what, what, uh, what genres do you write in? Uh, science fiction, fantasy on the both equally, probably. I go back and forth. Mm -hmm. okay. but all my fiction has fallen into the, except for my very first, my very, very first short story was actually kind of a little historical adventure thing for Western people, which was the magazine supplement to the Western producer agricultural newspaper. <laughs> Later, I sold them a science fiction story. I'm probably the only person that ever sold a science fiction story to the Western producer. But Wow, nice. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty much uh, straightforward science fiction and fantasy when it comes to fiction. Okay, uh, and well, how would you term your science fiction? Is it hard SF? Uh, that goes back or... and forth too. I've not. Mm -hmm. I've written far future space adventure. That tends to be. I suppose that's kind of where I I tend to end up when I'm writing straightforward science fiction. I just okay. just sold a new space opera, which will be in that mold as well, to Daw, which will be okay. out in a couple of years. Okay. But at the same time, my current series, even though they call it a portal fantasy, actually has a science fiction underpinning so it's really science fiction okay. disguised as fantasy so I, i'm pretty squishy on these things ah okay let's talk a little bit then about your your writing process how like what's a typical work day for you i don't have a typical work day oh, okay. it depends on what <laughs> projects i'm currently working on like uh, today i've done mm -hmm. two interviews so you know oh okay i have i'm a, doing some freelance editing so a content edit on this collection of short stories I'm working on. Uh, I do some little stuff for a company that prepares little sort of mini science fiction stories, which go to clients to, to insulate them against future shock, as near as I can tell. So these are some of the things that are okay. coming down the road. Here's some little scenarios. I've, so I've been working on those today. Right. What I haven't done anything on today is fiction. So, But I have that mm. novel I just sold, The Tangled Stars, to Daw, which is due in March, and it's 150,000 words. So I'm thinking I should probably start writing that sometime pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, so so you your contract for the uh, or specifies a, a word amount. That's interesting. Generally, in the ballpark, it's it's typically been a hundred thousand yeah. is kind of typical. But this mm -hmm. is a much more complex story, and so we agreed that it should be contracted at a bit more than that. But it, it ultimately, it doesn't matter that much as long as the story is complete and within a reasonable. Sure. You know, if I went half a million sure. words, they'd probably say something. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So let's let's say that you're you started working on this new book, and what do you plan as your work day to get that done in time? When I'm really working on fiction, I usually try to do a couple of sessions, and I I'll write for a couple of hours in a session. Mm -hmm. That's about what I do, and then I'll usually go on do something else. But I'm a pretty fast okay. writer. I I can. The fastest I've ever written anything, I wrote uh, Masks, which was the second book in the trilogy that I put out under one of my pseudonyms, E.C. Blake. Mm -hmm. And I know, no, was it? No, it was Shadows. That's the second book. Masks is the first book. See, I can't even remember my own books. <laughs> Shadows was 100,000 words thereabout, and I wrote it in a month, the first draft. Okay. So that's about my speed. Wow. If I'm really concentrating just on fiction, I can do that. And if everything's going well. Okay. And that, again, that was writing a couple of sessions a day, probably two or 3,000 words a session. Right. And do you do you tend to write early in the day or do you write in the middle of the night or it doesn't really matter? I can write in the morning and in the afternoon. I don't very often write in the evening. Mm -hmm. Do you, So would in the evening, if you are doing something writing related, would it be more like on a editing type of situation? Yeah, I'm doing that or I'm doing maybe copy editing, yeah, proofreading or... Right. Uh, yeah. Or in the case of something I'm publishing myself, I might be working on layout or cover design or all the myriad things that go along with, with doing that. Right. Yeah. I, I think generally speaking, most people that I've talked to are more creative earlier in the day. And so they tend to use that part of their brain in the morning. And in the afternoon, they just go to their, their critical side of the brain to do like more logical type work. Yeah. Sort of late morning, early afternoon seems to be my, my peak periods. Right. All right. So here comes a question that you've probably had a couple of times. Are you a plotter or a <laughs> pantser? <laughs> I do. I'm fortunate now in that most of my books for DAW are sold from synopses, which means mm -hmm. I am a plotter because I, I have to create something. I create the plot and put it down on paper in some fashion before I begin. Having said that, I typically don't look at that again once I've started writing unless I get into trouble somewhere along the way and things don't seem to be going right. right. Then I might actually go back and look and see what I originally thought was going to happen. So I don't know okay. I don't know where that puts me. I'm certainly not a detailed outliner, but I'm probably doing a 
you know, 10 single space page synopsis for anything oh, okay. that I'm wow. writing. That's, so that's, that's pretty in depth. So I, I assume that includes your cast of characters. Yeah, that'll, it'll, I, usually the synopsis will give the sort of the big overall picture. A lot of that is often backstory, mm -hmm. world building, and then right. a little bit about the characters, but not a huge, I don't do detailed character sketches really before I start. Oh, okay. I know kind of generally who they are, and then they kind of mm -hmm. uh, develop as I write. Okay. Uh, what do you use to write? Are you um, Word, uh, Scrivener? I write in Word. I have Scrivener, and one of these days I might mm -hmm. uh, climb the learning curve to use it. <laughs> but every time I look right. at it, I think, it's going to take me so long to learn how to use it. I could be writing on Word <laughs> while I'm doing that. So one of yeah. these days. I know people who mm -hmm. swear by it, and I know people who swear at it. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you ever dabbled with uh, trying to do recording, audio, narration? I I actually wrote one book that way, but it was a nonfiction book, and it was very useful because okay. it had a lot of quotes from other material, like newspaper articles and stuff. Oh, okay. And it's much easier to read those quotes mm -hmm. than to type them. So I found that very useful. Sure. I found that it changed the way, like it was much wordier, and I had to do more editing to tighten things up. Right. And I know authors, I mean, I've interviewed, uh, I mentioned David Weber, and I know that he dictates most of his books mm -hmm. because of an injury oh. that makes it difficult for him to type. But some people might say David Weber's books are pretty wordy, so I don't know if that's, <laughs> if that's part of that or not. <laughs> right, right. Okay, before we uh, dive into your new projects, I, I just wanted to do a little sidebar about podcasting because you also do podcasting. And can you tell us a little bit about the, the one that you do? Yeah, right at the time that the current series uh, started, World Shaper series, I started the podcast uh, concurrent with the first book in the series. And mm -hmm. the podcast is called The World Shapers because, you know, synergy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I'd always thought about podcasting and I'd just never done it. But I have the background as a as a reporter and I've also hosted mm -hmm. my own radio and TV shows. Oh wow. Over the years. And so I knew I could do it. Mm -hmm. And I finally did it. Yeah. And also I had all these contacts inside the genre. And my, I always wanted to talk to other authors about their creative process. So sure. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I reached out and to people I knew and I had, you know, I had big names ready and willing to come on. So I started my, my first four were Robert Sawyer, Tanya Huff, John Scalzi, and Julie Sharnada, which nice. is a pretty good opening salvo. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and I've just gone on from there. So I've had Tad Williams and David Brin and Joe Haldeman and V.E. Schwab. And I just interviewed F. Paul Wilson and I've got nice. Corey Doctorow coming up and you know, people are so generous with their time. So yeah. I'm up to about episode 66, I think. It's normally done every two weeks, although occasionally I'll go to a week when I'm doing that right now mm -hmm. when I have something to promote myself. And yeah, I won an Aurora Award for, for Best Fan-Related Work uh, and was shortlisted again this year. And out of that came the, uh, an anthology that I kickstarted, which we'll talk about in a minute. And sure. It's Yeah, it's just been great. It's an hour-long podcast and I do a full transcript, so it's a lot of work, but I... Oh, I bet. I've uh, really enjoyed doing it. Awesome. And I, I'm just curious because what I've just discovered recently uh, through talking with various writers is that audiobooks are really quite big nowadays. So I'm wondering if you're using your podcasting skills to uh, do any sort of audio work with your books. I did some audio recording but long before I did the podcasting. I, I recorded mm -hmm. a couple of books for somebody else. So I have done some audio recording. I've done two of my own books. I have the rights to my early jaw books. Mm -hmm. And but I've had that for about two years and I still haven't gotten around to the recording because it's time consuming. Yeah. It's so time consuming. So I will probably do more in the future. I certainly mm -hmm. plan to, but I've been planning to do so for some time now. <laughs> All right. Any thoughts of getting somebody, an actor or somebody to uh, to do them for you? Well, I've done that as well. Oh, OK. I have a series called The Shards of Excalibur, a young adult fantasy series. And it's the main character. Well, there's a like a 15 year old girl and a 14 year old boy. I don't have the voice for young characters. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm Marianne and I'm 15. You know, it just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work all that well. Right. So I did audition for that one through ACX and got a wonderful narrator named Elizabeth Clapp, who just, just okay. did a fabulous job of the entire series for me. Oh, fantastic. And of course, some of my books through DAW, they've, they've been sold to audiobook companies who then find the, the narrators themselves. Right, right. Yeah, because I, I, I've, I've really been taken aback by how how much or how popular audiobooks are for some authors it's like 60 percent of their sales and uh, that kind of blew me away so it's a market that i think maybe maybe writers do take it more seriously than than what i thought but my impression is a lot of them are surprised as well yeah it's there but 
I certainly don't see those kinds of figures <laughs> oh, okay. on the sales of my audiobooks. Mm -hmm. So I like having them out, but so far I can't say that the time it would take for me to record it and put it out there, I'm not entirely sure I will ever earn that back. So right. that's another consideration. Where do you, you only have so much time and what's the best way to use that time? Uh, absolutely. Alrighty. So let's turn over to your, your latest works that you've or releases. Which one do you want to tackle first? Well, we should talk about the Moonlit World, I guess. That's the okay. latest one from Da. Mm -hmm. This is uh, book three in a series called World Shapers. And the basic premise is, and it kind of tied in with the podcast as well, because it's the idea, it's like authors living inside worlds that they create. There's this labyrinth ah, of shaped worlds. Okay. Each world is shaped by someone who is now living in that world. All the shapers are from our world originally, and we're trained here. Mm -hmm. And then we're given a world to shape by the mysterious, turns out she's an alien uh, ah. named uh, Igrer. And so that's kind of the basic premise. And in the first book, World Shaper, my main character finds out that she's the shaper of the world she lives in she has forgotten, which isn't supposed to be possible. Mm. She thinks she's just living in the only world there is, but then uh, something happens and she's able to set back time. And that kind of is a twig that something odd is going on. And then a mysterious stranger named Carl Yatzer shows up and says, this is what's going on. And there's this adversary who's after you and uh, your world is lost. But if we can get into some other worlds, you can gather the knowledge of the shaping of them and help me take it to a Greer and we can save all these shaped worlds from this bad guy, the adversary. Okay. So the first book, world shaper they're in a world much like ours they have to get out of it which they spoiler they do <laughs> book two called master of the world was set in a, a world shaped by somebody who really likes jules verne so it's all ah. uh you know weird airships and submarines and floating islands and strange weapons and all that kind of jules vernian stuff okay and then the current one the moonlit world i like to sum it up as werewolves and vampires and peasants oh my <laughs> uh, because that's the kind of world it is. Uh, okay. it's, there's there's werewolves and there's vampires and they're peasants. And it used to be a peaceful world, but something's gone wrong. And Shauna and Carl are stuck in the middle of it trying to figure out who shaped it and get the knowledge of the shaping and escape it without getting turned into a werewolf or a vampire or, or just eaten. <laughs> cool, cool. So this series that has a pretty limited uh, format for it available to it, much like the original Star Trek, we have the whole galaxy to travel in. You've got all these worlds that you could go to what do you see for the arc of this series how many books are you looking at it's open-ended um i'm not mm -hmm. sure about the fourth book like the next book i've sold to daw is the tangled star so the fourth book as being with daw is in limbo however if i i do know what it is it'll mm -hmm. be set in a film noir world mm -hmm. which should be fun right. and i will write it and if daw decides they don't want to continue with it then i'll probably start bringing them out myself Right. It is limitless. It is open-ended to a certain extent. It does have an end point, and I kind of know how it ends mm -hmm. once they they get to where Agrair is hiding. Okay. So at a minimum, I think I would need maybe two, three more books to wrap it up. Okay. But the whole point of the concept in the first place was, although I was thinking Doctor Who, actually, which I think is the... Mm. The greatest storytelling conceit ever, because you can tell absolutely any kind of story <laughs> in a Doctor yep. Who framework from historical to, I mean, okay, it's always historical with aliens, but yeah. you, can, <laughs> you can tell any kind of story set any time, any place, and you don't even have to be consistent because, you know, timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which can lead to frustrations sometimes. But <laughs> well, yeah. the one thing, you know, and I, I was on a panel with Kevin Hearn, I think, and I don't remember who else at CanCon a couple of years ago about writing series. And of course, one of the big challenges in writing series is continuity. Mm -hmm. And you can easily make a, th especially if you're a pantser, you can easily make a throwaway decision on how something works that will come back to bite you a couple of books later when you realize your magic system or whatever you've established suddenly precludes you doing what you thought you were going to do. Right. But it's just, it's just a writing challenge. You just have to find a way around it. Right. And is this, is this an adult series? YA? That's a good question. The character is 27 <laughs> years old. Okay. That doesn't make it YA then. <laughs> the Moonlit World has, has a teenage character, but it's the first one of the three that has a teenage character. Uh, and yet both of the first two books were long listed for the Sunburst Award in the YA category. Oh, interesting. And I don't know what they, why they looked at these books and thought they were YA when but somebody did. So maybe mm. it's just because I've written YA in the past. I don't know. Uh, but okay. no, they're not intended as YA. They're not, you know, they're not exactly hot and steamy and all that kind of stuff. Right. They're, they're certainly teen reader friendly, but okay. they're not aimed at teen readers. Right. And the principal characters are Shauna Keys and Carl Yatsar? Yatsar, yeah. Yatsar. Uh, okay. And are they 
are they a, a couple or are they no is that a long arc <laughs> <laughs> that's not that is not an arc at all um, okay i don't think it's a spoiler to say that it's pretty for one thing he's older than she is okay and both in apparent years but also we find out that the last time he was in the first world was sometime around 1910 or earlier so okay okay <laughs> So they're quite separate in a lot of different ways. And it's established that he has his own goals, which preclude anything happening between him and, and Shauna. So, okay. No, they're not a couple. Okay. I think that's pretty well everything. It's a very interesting premise for sure. It's got legs, that's for sure. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun to write. And the other great thing about Shauna is that she left the first world, our world, her world is only 10 years old, although it looks like it's as old as any other world. But right. uh, so she was in our world up until 10 years ago. And so her background overlaps the real world up to that point, which means she has all the pop culture references for anybody up to about 2010, which okay. means when she's in this vampire world, she saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer and she's seen you know, Abbott and Costello meet the, were the wolf man. And all right. she, she makes Star Trek jokes and she makes Star Wars jokes. And <laughs> I've mentioned, I don't know who I've mentioned. I've, I've mentioned, I've dropped names like Connie Willis and people like that into the book because she, she's read this stuff. And that's one of the things that's a lot of fun for me as a writer is that it's, it's full of my kind of geeky internal humor. Only now it's on the page for everybody to see. <laughs> right, right. Okay, one question has come to me. How do they get between worlds? Is that a fantastical well, element or is there some sort of science? Yeah, it's they call it a portal fantasy, but it's not a fantasy because everything is actually super science. So mm -hmm. uh, it's alien it's alien technology. Ah, uh, okay. Carl has, there's a whole underpinning for where this, what this labyrinth really was and why it exists. And I haven't even explained it all. And some of that would be spoilers. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's actually a super science thing that, that feels like fantasy. Ah. I guess that's the way to describe it. So there okay. are portals between the worlds and there's only two portals for each world going two different directions. So they'll come in one and then they have to find the other one in order to move on to the next world. Oh, okay. Cool. Very cool. All right. So let's talk about your other book here. And that would be Shapers of Worlds. Yeah, that's the one that came out of the that's the one that came out of the podcast. Mm. So I mentioned I had some really great guests. And at the end of the first year, because I had started my publishing company, Shadowpaw Press, I'm a member of Sask Books, which is the Saskatchewan Publishers Association. And at their annual meeting in last year, they yeah, last year, just last year, wow. uh, they had a, a publisher came in and from Winnipeg who had successfully kickstarted an anthology. And she was talking about kickstarting. Mm -hmm. And I listened to that. And I but hey, I know some authors. <laughs> so I reached out to my first year guest. I had to cut it off somewhere. And that seemed to make as much sense as, as anything mm -hmm. to see who would be interested in contributing to this. And even the ones who were too busy, as people like Victoria Schwab tend to be, mm -hmm. and weren't able to take part, they were, they were generally very uh, supportive of the idea. So in the end, I... I it took me a while because it's a, it's a bit of a hill to climb to learn how to do a Kickstarter as well. Mm -hmm. But I made it all happen, did it successfully. Everybody contributed lots of great backers, rewards and everything. And it uh, it funded, overfunded, not a huge amount, but it did overfund. And so right. I was able to pay the authors a little bit more. Cool. And the book came out September 22nd in ebook. It's available in ebook everywhere. Uh, and the commercial print will be coming out in November, mid-November. Mm -hmm. And we have new stories from uh, Sean and McGuire, Tanya Huff, David. David Weber, L.D. Modisett Jr., D.J. Butler, Christopher Rocchio, John C. Wright, Shelley Adina, and me. <laughs> and uh, and then reprints from John Scalzi, David Brin, Joe Haldeman, Julie Shaneda, Fonda Lee, Dr. Charles E. Gannon, Gareth L. Powell, Derek Kuntzkin, and Thorea Dyer. So we've got World Fantasy Award winners and Hugo Award winners and Nebula Award winners and nominees and Aurora Award winners and every major British science fiction award winners, every major science fiction award is represented by somebody in this, right. in this wow. lineup. So I was I was really quite thrilled. Mm -hmm. That's an impressive lineup. Holy cow. Is there going to be another anthology follow-up to this or is this a one-shot? My intention is to do another Kickstarter in the new year. Cool. I've reached out to my second year guests. I already have a great lineup there of people who said they'd take part. Uh, people like Kelly Armstrong and Barb Hambly and mm. uh, S.M. Sterling. And, you know, so it's the same kind of level of, of authors. So, yeah, I, I hope that the Kickstarter will work again and there'll be a Shapers of Worlds volume two. And if the podcast keeps going, a volume three after that, and who knows how many. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And what is uh, Shapers of the Worlds is a pretty broad theme. Is that uh, indicative of the scope of the stories that you get for the anthology? Yeah, as I say in the foreword, it's not a themed anthology. 
anthology at all. Okay. It's it's a it's a showcase is what it is. Right. So the authors were free to contribute whatever story they wanted. If it was a reprint, it was up to them to pick the reprint that they wanted to, to showcase. So we have a couple that were written in the worlds that they're best known for or known for. Tanya Huff, when I talked to her, we focused on her novel, The Silvered which is her werewolf story, mm. and Napoleonic werewolves in that case. And so she wrote a story that was set in that world. Uh, Christopher Rocchio, who's uh, got a wonderful space opera series, Empire of Silence, wrote a story that was set in his world. Mm. But most of the rest of them, well, Dr. Uh, Charles E. Gannon wrote one set in his most best-known series. But I think all the rest of them were just stories that people wanted to... Oh, Shelley Adina, I guess, hers was set in her world, too. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, though, were not had no connection to... Uh, an, existing world or anything like that. It was very much just an opportunity to showcase, here's a showcase of authors. We've got everything from far future science fiction to near future science fiction to fantasy. There's a superhero story. Cool. There's just about anything you could, uh, David Weber, best known for far future space opera, wrote something that's completely different from that. So mm. It's uh, just a showcase of authors. Right. And what about your story? Is it connected to your, to your books? Nope, not at all. Okay. It's a it's a standalone. It 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 ties in. I like to put a little Saskatchewan into my books when I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a science fiction story that is set in small town Saskatchewan. Oh, cool, very cool. All right, so that's called Shapers of Worlds, and it's available now in uh, ebook form, and it'll be out in print in November fourteenth. Is that correct? November November seventeenth is what 17th? I'm currently hearing from the distributor. Yeah, it's okay. printed but it's when the distributor gets it out. So. Sure, sure. Okay, is there any other projects that you've got on the go right now that you want to talk about? Well, I should just mention, because it just came out this week. <laughs> okay. There's another ebook I just put out with print to come, and it's my little publishing company, Shadowpaw Press, which is who published Shapers of Worlds. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I created it was to bring out some of my stuff that had fallen by the wayside over the years, as many authors are doing. Sure. And... A couple of years ago, four years ago now, I had a book called Flames of Neviana, which was published by a company called uh, Rebel Light in Winnipeg, which is now gone. Mm. It's about the fourth publisher I've killed. I hope Daw hangs on. <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I don't think it's my fault, but you start to wonder after three yeah. or four of them go under. Yeah. So I wanted to bring that out again. And because it's a young adult, kind of an epic young adult fantasy novel, very much in the, the frame of what? I wrote in my trilogy, The Masks of Agrima, under the pseudonym E.C. Blake. I've now brought it out under its original title, which was Blue Fire, and as by E.C. Blake. So there's a brand new E.C. Blake novel <laughs> mm -hmm. just out from uh, a young adult fantasy out from uh, Shadowpaw Press as well. Just an ebook right now. I'm working on the print book, but of course, that is, again, time takes time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's great. Well, I, I just have a couple of non-related questions. I'm just going to throw it at you um, because 2020 is such a, uh, a unique year in so many so many ways. Of course, with the COVID situation, pandemic conventions and and things of uh, you know any sort of public gatherings, signings for authors and that, book readings. A lot of that's gone by the wayside. A lot of writers have tried to do virtual for uh, substitutes and for like for uh, for us like you and i we go to the uh, when worlds collide convention in, which is held in calgary every year and in, in, around august and that one had to go virtual and it was interesting and i i kind of enjoyed it at, from an aspect of i didn't have to leave my home and i could go to my own <laughs> bed and that so that was cool but it definitely you miss the social side of it uh, mingling with people and the face-to-face -face stuff is always much more impactful, I find, than doing stuff over Zoom or whatnot. So I'm curious, how, how have you found that? Has it changed your work schedule much or not really? It doesn't really change the way I work, except that I haven't been writing in pubs and coffee shops, okay. which I kind of miss. Ah. The, the biggest disruption, when, I, when it started, when things closed down, uh, I was writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. Okay. Uh, and so I had to suddenly switch to a virtual model for that which wasn't mm -hmm. too bad. People were sending me stuff by email anyway. And I was, you know, using track right. changes and things. And we were just getting together in person to talk. So I started doing that virtually. Right. The biggest thing at the time was that my wife was working from home. So she'd taken over my office and I was relegated <laughs> to my, my laptop. Uh -huh. And in a, in a way, it was good for me because I was not long. I was no longer driving up to Saskatoon every week and staying over one night and eating at a restaurant. So I actually made more money <laughs> for mm. those two and a half months. Right. But it hasn't it hasn't otherwise really affected me too much, except for, as you say, the missing of there's two conventions I would have been at 
maybe mm-hmm. three. And then, you know, I every year I go to Fan, um, it's not Fan Expo anymore, Sask Expo here in China, oh, right. right. Saskatoon. And I usually sell a thousand dollars worth of books off my table mm. at each one of those. And so I lost that this year and, right. and things like that. So, yeah, I've done some of the virtual stuff. I've done some virtual workshops and I'm doing a virtual writer in residence thing in conjunction with the Saskatchewan Writers Guild annual meeting coming up. It's it's a sub it's it's not really a substitute. It's nice that we can still do those things, but they don't mm-hmm. really substitute for face to face meetings in bookstore readings, actual book launches with people there and food and so forth. You know, right? Uh, that's kind of a pale substitute. For sure. And in terms of your writing, has it impacted you any way? Do you, when the world is in such dire, uh, at least it seems like a dire situations that we haven't experienced in, in generations, did you, do you find it mentally difficult to write? Or is that something that you maybe just bothered you for a couple of weeks and uh, you're sort of over it now and it's, uh, you're back to normal? I can't say that I've noticed any particular impact on my, on my writing. Okay. I like to point out, you know, as I'm, I'm old enough that I can remember as a teenager figuring that there'd be a nuclear war before I was 20 or 25. <laughs> so, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is my fourth, fourth pandemic, I think. Third pandemic. I just missed the 57 one. Okay. Right. Yeah. We're about, we're of the same uh, vintage then because uh, uh, I have the similar experiences that you do. But it's just, uh, for you, it doesn't sound like it'd be an issue because you're, you're writing mostly in science fiction and fantasy, but it's, I'm always curious how writers who base works in present day times how they're going to handle that going forward in their stories are they just going to ignore it or are they going to incorporate it into their story uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out i guess it depends when it's set um mm-hmm. oh, for sure you can either yeah. set things beforehand so you don't have to worry about it yeah or there'll be i'm sure there's going to be a wrap there already are some there's going to be a lot of novels that are set during this time mm-hmm. the situation will become a part of the story i would think is what would happen and then there's going to be historical novels set in this time going forward too so <laughs> yeah yeah i think horror writers probably will have the most fun with it i guess uh, if fun's the right word but the most <laughs> opportunities to, to make use of it i think for sure all righty i think that's everything is there anything that hasn't come up that you'd like to mention at this time no uh, no i think we've covered most things awesome so why don't you fill people in where they can find out where to reach you uh, and you know uh, if you're on social media Feel free to give out your Twitter handles or Instagram or whatever it is. My main website is edwardwillett.com. Two T's on Willett. That always gets dropped off. (laughs) Edwardwillett.com. You can buy books directly from me at edwardwillettshop.com. You can even download some eBooks directly there. Cool. The podcast is theworldshapers.com. The publishing thing is shadowpawpress.com. And again, you can buy the books directly from there. Like Shapers of Worlds, you can order the print book, and uh, download the ebook right now directly from shadowpotpress.com. Okay. Uh, on social media, I'm at E Willett, E W I L L E T T. On Facebook, I'm at Edward Dot Willett. And on <laughs> Instagram, I'm Edward Willett Author because I missed the memo about having the same uh, handle on all social media accounts. Ah. And you can also find the World Shapers on Facebook and on Twitter, uh, just at the World Shapers. Very cool. It was a pleasure to have you on board, and uh, I thank you very much for coming on, Ed. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, that's great. So, folks, I'll have all those contacts in the liner notes for this episode as well. And uh, as usual, stay safe, but stay scared. <laughs>